and uh, it compared a whole variety of, of pulses from 12 hertz up to 1000 hertz, right, flashes. And of course, 1000 hertz you can't see. You know, 12 hertz you can just about see, 12 flashes per second. Right? Anything slower than that is not really worthwhile because the higher the frequency, the better the result, and then the continuous wave cell growth was significantly better than all of the uh, flashing ones. Um, a lot of clients are concerned about getting radiation with light therapy. Um, I would say that, I mean, the laser has been around since 1960, and the laser is much more potent than, than LEDs, and there hasn't been a single case of iatrogenic cancer reported in the literature, and that would have been reported really, really well. In fact, uh, the godfather of phototherapy is Professor Endre Mester from Hungary. Uh, he unfortunately died in 1984. And he, in the early days, in 1968, when the laser was eight years of age, there was worry, exactly the same worry. People were asking, oh, this is going to cause cancer because it's activating cells. So he took 80 mice. He shaved the hair off their backs. He irradiated 40 of them with a ruby laser, pulsed ruby laser. Very low power, right? but he irradiated. None of the animals got any carcinogenic change whatsoever with a six-month follow-up, but the animals that had their uh, backs irradiated grew their hair back much, much faster. <laughs> much faster. So that was the first paper that showed hair growth with a laser. And it's often quoted uh, as being one of the scientific proofs that laser does work on regenerating hairs. I have another example. I, uh, 13 weeks ago, I had both my knees replaced. I had full total knee replacement. Before that, I had to shave my legs completely, which I did. And I've been treating with heel light and I'll be happy to show you my scars, <laughs> but I'll also happy to show you where the hair has grown back in the area irradiated by the heel light compared with the other areas. Right, so it does regenerate hair that wants to be regenerated. So what did your ortho surgeon say about your healing? Oh, they were, they were absolutely gobsmacked. I mean, uh, I couldn't actually irradiate until the third day because it was all bandaged up. But then they took off the bandages and put on a little tegaderm strip, and so I could have at it. And the inflammation and the pain and the edema dramatically dropped within a week so that everybody's going, wow, and I'm walking. Oh, you know, yeah, I, I love it. <laughs> Gentleman at the back. Duration of fluids, you, um, I guess you've studied that, so is there an optimal uh, duration? Yes, yep, yep, uh, good question. Uh, dosimetry is extremely important. Wavelength is important and after wavelength comes dosimetry. When you think of a dose with light, two things determine the dose. One is the power in watts or milliwatts per square centimetre, and the other is the time that these watts are on the tissue. One watt for one second is one joule. Right? A thousand watts for a millisecond is one joule. <laughs> now a thousand watts is going to do a lot more damage than one watt. Right? So the more important than the dose is the irradiance. In the case of the heel light, it's 100 milliwatts per square centimeter. And if we apply that for 10 minutes, we get 60 joules per square centimeter. In order to arrive at that, uh, this is, study was also done, of course, for Omnilux, because that was the same dose that we recommended for Omnilux, uh, 830. And we started with 20 joules, 40 joules, 60 joules, 100 joules, 200 joules, 500 joules per square centimetre. And we watched how these doses worked in cell culture 
of first passage human fibroblasts, gingival fibroblasts, because they, they, they work faster than the skin fibroblasts. And we found that between 50 and, or between 40 and 60 joules per square centimeter, there was a huge difference in the efficacy, but between 60 and 100, <coughs> tiny increase in efficacy. But of course, the time required to deliver that dose is much longer. And the same applied for 200 and 500. A, a steady little increase, but not statistically significant. Right? So we believe that for this particular system, you know, and, and, and LEDs at 830, 60 joules per square centimeter is ideal. Now you can deliver it over different periods. There are four intensities available with the system, one to four, four being the top intensity. And at four, uh, intensity four, it's 11 minutes for total irradiation, one minute for 590, and 10 minutes for 830. So we, we did do dose ranging studies to see if we'd got the optimum dose, and we think we have. Lady there. If um, you're having laser hair removal on your face. Yes. And you do the light therapy on your face. Yes. Trying to stimulate more growth of the hair. If you do it very quickly after the... So the how long should you leave it between? Well, you, you should really leave it to see what's going to happen with your hair removal. Um, and I would say three to six months, right? Because that allows any hairs that are quietly sleeping there to jump into catagen. Right? Um, it does encourage, right? But hopefully your hair removal has been good and it has destroyed not just the hair, but the bulge, right? In the hair follicle which is where the stem cells are. And if you don't get them, you, ain't, you, you will get hair coming back. You shouldn't be recommending this treatment for somebody who's having no. existing hair removal. No, no, you know, let it, you know, let it be for six months. And if the hair hasn't started to come back, or if it comes back very, very finely, vellus hair, which it probably will do, you can treat. Okay. Right? But if the hair starts to come back a little coarse, then don't, because it means there are stem cells lurking around there. Um, I've sort of held back on LED therapy and got something else at the beginning, and it's time for me to upgrade. I've used it to heal burns, all sorts of things, and it's advertised as 3,200 nanometer light depth, blah, 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 and the rest of it. But I think it might be more chromotherapy, but I have used it on burns successfully. Yes. Not so much on acne, and that's called the biopsion light. Yeah, the bioptron. Yeah, from Switzerland. So yep, yep, yep. Did you pass that as chromotherapy rather than...? No. Oh, no, 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 because you're only using one wavelength. So they have the colour filters on Well, you know, but you don't use, you don't kind of shift the filters around. You treat with that, whatever, it, what, which wavelength do you normally use? Well, it's just the one. It's preset, and then it's if you use a filter, so... Ah, uh, uh, well, I mean, it's a white light. It's not a... Okay, it's, yeah. 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 It comes out it's yellow with nothing over with no right. on it whatsoever. Um, I have found it on burns to be brilliant, and that was on a burn on a radiator. Right, as well. right, so right. I thought, well, that's what I've got from therapy. It's not really LED. No, it's not. It no, it, 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 see, the, if you look at the Max 7, which is the one that flashes rainbows over your skin while scanning. So two no-nos. One, it's not continuous on the skin, it's scanned, so when it's here, it's not here. <laughs> and the other thing is that it changes color, you know, the seven colors of the rainbow. <laughs> um, so the efficacy of that system has yet to be proven. Uh, many people are using it for an expensive paperweight <laughs> because it doesn't really do very much. Now, the Bioptron, on the other hand, has got good science. And the wavelengths of the filters are carefully chosen. And I bet that when you were using either red or one of the infrared filters on your, on your burn wound is when you would be getting the good results. Uh, we have a, um, a study going on in the States at the moment on post burns with the, the heel light, which is producing very interesting data. And we did some wonderful studies. You'll see some examples of burn wounds later in this presentation treated with 830. You can either use 830 or 633. 
If you use 633, it is restricted to the scalp, the blood vessels in the scalp, and really that's what uh, stops the alopecia in its tracks, is increased vascularity, better oxygenation, but you're also getting degranulation of mast cells, because red light also degranulates mast cells. If you use the 830, you go deeper than the scalp. And for example, for stress alopecia, you get rid of the stress because the 830 causes this systemic reaction with um, parasympathetic dominance. In other words, the rest and relax part of our body takes over. And it takes away the cortisol and the uh, norepinephrine, which are the two big st stress hormones. And that helps stop stress alopecia. So it does work. Do you need to show, or would you need to chase it within a certain period of time? No, no, the earlier you obviously no, the earlier you treat it, the better. You know, but even if it's if it's pretty far advanced, it will halt it. But will it bring it back? It depends if there are any uh, follicles left, or if there are any stem cells left in in the affected area. What yes. about um, radiation or chemotherapy? Would that help? bring any hair back? Or what, what kind of therapy? Chemotherapy or radiation? Chemotherapy, yes, for chemo, um, because what happens with chemo is that there is a, a little pathway called the FAS, FAS pathway, and that drops from catagen to telogen and prevents anagen, which is why the hair drops out and doesn't come back. Um, with particularly 830, you can actually bring hair back for uh, chemo, uh, baldness due to chemo. And is it safe to use while they're on chemo? Is it safe while they're on chemo? Oh yes, perfectly safe. Yep, 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 yep. yep. I mean, uh, in fact, the, the birth of LED therapy was as an anti-cancer treatment with PDT. That's where um, Omnilux came from, and Omnilux was the first LED system on the market in 2002. I'm just concerned about the hair growth. Mm -hmm. Someone who's not having, say, IPL, like hair removal, but get the hormonal hair, and they're doing a treatment with LED. The chances are that they would get paradoxical hair growth. Yeah. Um, I, I have to, I, I have been treating clients um, for quite a long time now, probably 18 months, and she would have an LED facial, well, maybe every, every three to four weeks, um, and she has electrolysis only every eight weeks. Okay, and there's been no stimulation of that yeah, yeah, type of thing we've talked about. So no, the hair that I'm treating is great. Okay, so no, I haven't found that it's that's, that's the norm, but I think to be fair to your clients, you have to do a, a little workup and see if they have a hormonal problem. Right? And then they, you know, it needs to be in your informed consent that they uh, consent to have the treatment having been informed that it might cause hair growth. But it doesn't happen in everybody, as, as you heard from this lady here. <coughs> Yes, sir. So the benefit is not to get all the uh, reticular sites and the epithelial sites. But we want to talk about uh, stem cells in the skin. Is there any attempt to specifically target those with a, with a wavelength, or do you think that's the knock-on effect will uh, stimulate those? Right. Um, there has been some work with LLLT and stem cells. Um, it is, it's, it's our old friend 830 was shown to sustain a stem cell culture and to help it to grow, but not particularly fast. However, when we put, you heard from Ron this morning, EGF, epidermal growth factor, and FGF, fibroblast growth factor, that really gets stem cells worked up. And when we irradiate the macrophages, we get fibroblast growth factor. So both direct activation of stem cell with light and giving them some FGF you know, to, to boost them on a bit um, is, I mean, that's, that's in the future. And uh, Dr. Moy and I are going to be talking about this tomorrow. We think that there is definite synergy between his uh, preparation 
and light. Right? And in fact, between many preparations and light. Yes? Say if you're doing, say, an excision and flap, you can put them under pre and post immediately. Good question. Um, if the patient can come in 24 hours before, it's good because it's kind of kick-starting the wound healing so that when the damage is done, the cells are ready to go and then you treat after. If it's like um, fairly severe surgery, like a flap, for example, you would treat 24 hours before, you would treat as soon as possible afterwards, as soon as possible. And then you treat 24 hours, 72 hours, and then twice a week for the next three weeks for a flap. And I think I've got, uh, in later in the presentation, some 830 nanometers on axial flap model. So it shows you perfusion of the flap, but that wasn't done before, that was done immediately after. Right, this is, the, this is part of the systemic effect, is phototherapy and, and blood flow, but it also extends to lymphatic flow, because we must remember we have two vascular systems. We have the blood vessel system and we have the lymphatic system. And LLLT works really nicely on any lymphatic problem, for example, post-axillary uh, lymphedema, if any lady has had her um, lymph nodes removed from the axilla, the arm can really swell up nastily. That is treated wonderfully with 830, and there are several papers on that in the literature. So, this is, this is the axial pattern flap model. This was um, a study done by a colleague in Japan, Junichiro Kubota, and he used uh, 830 nanometers defocused diode laser, so it's not an LED, but it's the same wavelength, and it was the same joules per square centimeter. And the big problem with flaps, as you heard from uh, contribution from the lady back there, is that if they fail, it's a disaster. So how do you prevent them failing from a poor blood supply? Well, we tested 830 uh, on in vivo. We had 20 animals, one irradiated group and one unirradiated group that were treated in exactly the same manner. 830 was delivered in continuous wave, 60 joules per square centimeter, and laser Doppler speckle flowmetry was used to assess the blood flow in the flap. Now, it was a very clever setup. The flap was raised, the animal was placed underneath uh, an impervious sheet, all of which was sterile, and this was put over the bed, and then the flap was placed back on top of the sheet. So only the flap was irradiated, not the rest of the animal. And only the flap could be seen by the speckle flowmetry. So it was a high